Welcome back. I'm continuing my conversation with Zanda, a professor at Harvey Mudd College, about topic models. And we're continuing that conversation today uh, by talking about variational inference. If you didn't watch the previous video, you might want to go back to get the big picture and how to do inference with Gibbs sampling. Variational inference is doing exactly the same thing. Given some data, infer the underlying hidden variables. Why do we need two ways of doing it? Lots of reasons. I'll actually give you a quick five. VI models, variational inference models, are deterministic, so they're easy to debug. It's easy to tell when you've converged. They require far fewer iterations to converge. They make more sense for an optimization framework like PyTorch, and they don't require conjugate distributions, which are a more complicated thing we can discuss later. That sounds great. Why should anybody ever learn about Gibbs sampling, then, if variational inference is so great? Well, the math for VI is tougher. A lot tougher. We'll get through it, but Gibbs sampling is a walk in the park compared to this. So a lot of people reasonably prefer to use Gibbs sampling. But are the results the same? Theoretically, they should be. But a lot of people prefer the outputs of Gibbs sampling. This sounds like something somebody should research. Well, let's jump in then. So the setup is you have observations, which are our words, x, hidden variables, or topic assignment, z, some hyperparameters, alpha, and you want the posterior distribution over the hidden variables. But can you just write down the posterior distribution with some algebra? In many cases, this is intractable. Specifically, there's usually a denominator that requires integrating over an inconveniently huge number of possible outcomes. Even for models simpler than topic models, you run into problems. Take a really simple model called the Gaussian mixture model. This tries to partition a data set into a fixed number of clusters. Each cluster has its own mean vector, mu sub k in space, and each data point gets assigned to one of the clusters. The posterior distribution over mu and z describes how likely each of the clusters are. But you just wrote down the distribution. There it is. What do you mean it's intractable? Just because you can write down something doesn't mean you can calculate it. The sum and the integral over all the possible means and cluster assignments is really computationally expensive. Even if you have a huge computer cluster, it'd be pretty hard to compute what it is. OK, but we could do expectation maximization here, right? I love that instinct because not only is that correct, EM is very closely connected to variational inference. Let's do a brief refresher. Expectation maximization is essentially alternating between guessing the latent variables, updating parameters of the distribution that govern the latent variables, and then guessing the latent variables again. So let's say that we have some data points in 2D for a Gaussian mixture model. Uh, what would the variational parameters be? You would have two, one for the means, our model parameters, and one for the assignments, our latent variables. Let's say we have variational parameters for the means gamma, and we initialize two clusters randomly. OK, uh, then we need another variational parameter for the assignment of each point to a cluster. Let's call that phi. Awesome. Phi for each point will encode a vector for that point over each of the possible clusters it could be assigned to. Uh, but in the generative story, the cluster assignment z is matching every point to a single cluster. Why is it now a vector? So it's a variational distribution over your latent variables. Since the cluster assignment is a categorical variable, the variational distribution is a multinomial distribution over the different values it could take on. OK, then we have to do the same thing for all of the points. Yep. And then you can update the cluster centers based on the updates to our phi vectors, which are encoded by a variational parameter, gamma. Uh, and using pluses here is a little misleading, right? As there really should be a full variational distribution over the mean for each cluster. Yeah, that's right. This is just showing the mean of that distribution. Is this actually legit? Does doing this actually maximize the likelihood of the underlying model? That's a great question, and working through the derivation of variational inference will help us prove that it is. For reasons that will become clear in a moment, I hope, let's say that our latent variables come from a distribution q. Let's call this the variational distribution, and it's parameterized by nu. 
Okay, then I think I see what we're doing. We're taking a guess of what the latent variables are, and that guess is encoded, described, by the parameters of this distribution Q. This should remind you of Gibbs sampling, too. You take a guess about one thing, update another, and then repeat. The difference here is that you choose a queue that is both convenient to work with so that we can find clear parameter updates and as close as possible to the true distribution over latent variables, P. What does it mean for two distributions to be close to each other? We'll use something called the kolbach liebler divergence to measure the distance between distributions. Here's the definition. It's sometimes called the KL divergence for short. Let's think about the various cases of P being big or small, and Q being big or small. If both are big, uh, they cancel out, and you have log of 1, which is close to 0, so you don't pay a big price. If Q is high, but P isn't, then you have a big number, and the distributions are considered to be far apart. But on the other hand, if Q is low, then we don't care about what's going on since it's in the numerator. If KL is zero, then the distributions are equal because you have one over one in the input uh, to the log function, and then it's zero everywhere. Yes, this is often called mode splitting. We're looking for a Q that finds one good solution, not a Q that finds every possible solution. Maybe we can see a picture to make it clearer. We have Q as the red distribution, and we're looking for a place where both Q and P are high. But Q can't be high when P is not. Great. Okay. Time for a little diversion. Have you heard of Jensen's inequality? It's been a while since my analysis class. Uh, it's something about concave functions? Yeah. Let's consider a concave function f, like the logarithm, and two points, x1 and x2. Look at that nice concave down curve right there. Let's say you also interpolate between those two points using some weight t. So if t is 0 and you get x1, if t is 1, you get x2, and in general the interpolation is a point on this line here between exactly. x1 and x2. Yes, that's perfect. So which is going to be bigger then? The concave function called on the x-coordinate for the interpolation or the actual interpolation value we found on the line segment from x1 to x2? Well, the picture seems to suggest that the interpolation of the function is always going to be on a line between the concave function. Exactly. As you might guess from the visual proof sketch right here, the reverse is true for a convex function. Just think what happens if you flip the image vertically. We won't prove it here, but you can go a bit further and generalize this to an expectation over a set. A convex function, like a log taken of an expectation, is greater than the expectation of the function. And in the case of variational inference, we'll have an expectation over the variational distribution, and we'll have the log as part of our objective? Our objective function is the log probability of the data, which we get from our generative story, which I mentioned in a previous video. The higher the number is, the better we do at explaining our data. So let's start off by integrating over all latent variables z, and then we'll multiply by 1. But in this case, multiplying by 1 is multiplying by q of z over q of z. Right, and we do this because we want to be able to write this as an expectation. So the argument of the expectation is p of x and z, and we take the expectation with respect to the distribution q of z. This is the integral over z multiplied by q of z, so it's the expectation over q. Right. And then after that, we'll flip the expectation and the log using Jensen's inequality. That also causes the equal sign to turn into a greater than sign. And then... We break the log into two parts using the linearity of expectation, and that the logarithm of quotient is the difference of the logarithm of the numerator and the logarithm of the denominator. Gosh, I love logs. But that denominator looks familiar. Isn't that just the entropy of the variational distribution? You got it. And this whole objective is called the evidence lower bound, or elbow for short. 
This is a lower bound of the log probability. Yep. <laughs> so, but if we maximize this, we're maximizing the log probability. Exactly. That's really the whole point of variational inference. We can't maximize the true likelihood directly, so we're optimizing this friendlier expression instead. Of course, this is one way of deriving the variational objective. Let's look at another way of defining the variational objective. In this view, you're trying to minimize the distance between P and Q. Where distance, again, is that funky KL divergence that we talked about before. So if we plug these two distributions into the definition of KL divergence, we can again turn the log of a quotient into the log of the numerator minus the log of the denominator. Then it looks like you do it again using the definition of conditional probabilities. And the last term, log p of x, has a plus sign because you had two minuses that canceled out. True, but actually we can totally drop that part because it doesn't depend on q at all. Q is the distribution over latent variables, so if we have terms that don't depend on Q, then they're effectively constants for us and there's no point keeping them around for optimizing. When you do this, does the term look familiar? It's just the negative of the elbow from before. The expectation of the log joint under Q and the entropy of Q. Exactly. So minimizing KL divergence is the same as maximizing the elbow. Let's shift gears. Thus far, we've been talking about the variational distribution in very abstract terms, but what is it? One common way of creating a variational distribution is to write all of the variables in what's called mean field form. It's a product of individual terms. Why is it called mean field? Like much of machine learning, this concept actually comes from statistical physics. Physicists wanted to model the interaction of multiply connected particles, but couldn't model all interactions, so they just took each particle as its own potential. Here's Polly's write-up of the lens icing model that inspired this model. Then, they were able to use expectations, means, of potentials for individual particles instead of their relationships, and multiply them all together to get an estimate. So all of the latent variables are independent? As far as Q knows, but we're not just looking at Q in isolation. While the parameters are independent in Q, we're picking them in a way to best model what P should be. So you'll find the best match of the distribution given the representational power of Q. But odds are that you won't actually find the true posterior, right? Right, because the true posterior is likely a non-independent mess. No matter what parameter we stick into Q, we're not going to have those dependencies right. If you find this causes a big problem in that this independence assumption makes it impossible to get a good data fit, you don't have to stick to the mean field assumption. You can tweak your variational distribution to clump some of the variables together so they're not independent. There's a classic paper on gating to discuss when you should do this. That said, people generally like to start with our independent mean field assumption. Okay, so let's say that we have a variational distribution that we're happy with. How do we do variational inference? This is much like those SGD updates that you've been talking about for other models. You first initialize all of your variational parameters randomly. Then you take turns doing updates of each of the variational parameters Q sub i, and you repeat until you reach convergence. This also feels like Gibbs sampling. Condition on all of the other variables, sample the odd one out. But this term, derive elbow, seems kind of ominous. How would we actually do this for a real model? Good question. Well, I'm already here as an established Topic Models fan, so let's do this next for latent Dirichlet allocation in our next video. If you want to see more videos like this, check the video description for the course that comes from the link down below. You can then see the context and the correct order for watching these videos. YouTube will gleefully show you stuff in the wrong order. If you want other people to see this video, provide a big gradient to the recommendation algorithm by clicking the like and subscribe button down below.